Okay, everyone. So uh, welcome to our Joma Teen Health Initiative webinar series. My name is Dr. Jackie Benyun, and I will be the moderator today. Um, Joma is the Jewish Orthodox Women's Medical Association. We're a nonprofit organization whose membership includes Jewish Orthodox female physicians and trainees. Our goal is to provide evidence-based preventative health and women's health education to the Orthodox community. Today, we will address the topic of educating teenage boys about going back to school, including topics such as mental health, vaccines, and sports physicals. This webinar is aimed at taking religious teenage boys through uh, his well visit at his doctor's office. Before I introduce our first speaker for today, I would like to inform you that we will have a question and answer session at the very end when the last speaker finishes speaking. All questions should be posted in the question box. There are two boxes on the bottom of your screen. There's a Q&A box and a chat box. Please use the Q&A box to post any questions. If you would like your question to remain anonymous, please hit the remain anonymous button. There will be no option to post in the chat. We ask everyone to use the Q&A box. You will also notice that every person viewing the webinar is anonymous. You cannot see the other attendees that are on this webinar and your presence here is completely anonymous. Your voice and video uh, cannot be enabled. Again, when asking a question, if you want to remain anonymous, just select that button. So our first speaker tonight is Dr. Jennifer Berkovich. Dr. Jenny Berkovich is a board certified pediatrician. She, she received her medical degree at Nova Southeastern University and she completed her pediatric residency at Nicklaus Children's Hospital formerly known as Miami Children's Hospital. She was the recipient of the Senior Resident Teaching Award, um, as well as the ACOP Resident of the Year Award. She is currently the Medical Director of Telehealth for Pediatric Associates, a multi-state pediatric practice. She also serves on the AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics section on Telehealth Care Executive Committee. She lives in Chicago and enjoys spending time with her family exercising and working as the director of education at JOMA. So without further ado, Dr. Berkovich. All right, thank you, Jackie. I'm gonna share my screen. Hold on, started in the end. Now you guys saw the, saw the spoiler, you saw how it's gonna end. Let's start from the beginning. So I, I actually first, I, I wanna say, I wanna start off by saying that uh, teenage boys are one of my favorite patient populations. And as a pediatrician, it's one of the most challenging and rewarding populations to care for. And challenging meaning that unlike younger kids, teenagers in general, and especially boys, are not uh, a frequent, as frequent visitors um, to, to the office of a pediatrician. When kids are little, when kids are babies, they come pretty frequently because they require uh, frequent visits and frequent checkups, um, school forms, things like that. And as kids get older, those requirements become less and less. And I find that teenagers, especially boys, show up less and less frequently. So I, I wanna congratulate you all by um, by virtue of just being here and showing interest and, and making, making time to learn about this valuable topic, you're already a step ahead. You're already taking, taking the steps to empower yourself with knowledge and education of, of how to care for this very, very important and vulnerable population. So I wanna start um, by talking a little about what, what happens um, at, at a checkup for a teenager about why we ask the things that we ask and a very, very important concept when we talk about care, caring for teenagers, which is a confidentiality piece. I'll mention a little bit about some of the mental health screening questions, which I think are more important now that they've ever been. Um, I wanna talk about the exam we do for scoliosis and mention some of the critical vaccines that we give in this age group. So interval history. So I usually start the conversation with, what do you want to talk about? And I'm very careful about how I phrase this question because I phrase it to the child at this point, by the time that somebody's a teenager, I really want to work on empowering them to take care of their health and to, to feel empowered to, to ask me questions that they have, not necessarily questions that their parent may have. It's a conversation between myself, the child, and the parent. 
So I usually start by asking, what has happened since the last time we saw you? If it's a child that's coming very frequently for sick visits, if it's somebody that has chronic medical conditions that we see them often, that question is usually very easy for me because I probably know what's been happening. But if it's not somebody we see frequently, I want to know, has there been, uh, have there been emergency room or urgent care visits since the last time we saw you? Have there been any hospitalizations? Those are all really important pieces for me to know as a pediatrician to make sure that I'm addressing any necessary follow-ups that happen and to make sure that I am seeing any patterns that are happening that other disjointed ways of care may not. So for example, if someone's going to ER after ER after ER for maybe fractures, that's a concern for me. Maybe those other ERs or urgent care don't know about their prior visits. But as a pediatrician, it is my job to know all the prior visits that they have to try to put those pieces of the puzzle together and try to find out, is there something going on, something more concerning happening than just you know intermittent injuries? Then we talk about any complaints that the child or the parent may have, anything that's come up over the last year or the last time that we saw them obviously reviewing any pertinent medical history and allergies um, or, or any, any medications that they've started to take since the last time we saw them. It's important to ask about dental care. Teenagers, I think especially teenage boys, maybe for, forget this really important step. So I really like to make sure that they're not only going to the dentist, but taking proper care of their teeth on a regular basis. Diet is a big one. So teenagers, notoriously, not, not great um, not necessarily great decision makers when it comes to um, caring for themselves and um, making good health choices. So I really like to start maybe around 11, 12 years old, start to really gear the conversation towards the child to say, what are you eating? Why are you making those choices? And making sure that they don't just give, you know, eat, eat, eat whatever is available and just kind of roll their eyes when healthy food is offered and steer more towards the junk food, but really start to take ownership of the choices that they're making. I like asking about bathroom habits because usually that's not something that the parent necessarily knows about. So then I can really have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with the, with the child and the teenager about this. But um, I ask how often they're going and make sure they're not constipated. Constipation is a big topic in pediatrics. My general rule is most kids are constipated until proven otherwise. And I think teenagers are sometimes a little bit shy and don't want to talk about it, but it can really be a huge influence on their quality of life. So we really want to make sure that that's not an issue. It's usually a pretty simple issue to solve. I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about the mental health screen and then um, the, the physical exam um, Dr. Siegel is going to focus a little bit more on. I'm just going to touch on one piece of it, which is the scoliosis or back. Confidentiality. So this is a big one. Starting somewhere between 10 and 12, um, depending on my relationship with the family, I do ask the parents or the caregivers, whoever came with a child, to step out of the room. And then I have what, what I call sort of level setting with the child. I explain to them that whatever is discussed between myself and them is completely confidential. confidential. And with very, very few exceptions, it's actually illegal for me to disclose anything that we talked about to anybody outside of the room. I'll document it in the medical record, but things that are truly sensitive, I do have the option of marking confidential. And so if a parent were to ever request records, that information would not be in there. I make sure that the child really feels comfortable. And that's why I start the conversation like 10, 11, 12, just explaining this to them one-on-one. -on -one. So that way, when they are a little bit older, 16, 17, and maybe some more sensitive issues come up, they already feel comfortable and they know to expect to be able to have a private conversation with me by the time that they're old they're that age. I did mention a few exceptions of breaking confidentiality, and I do share these upfront with the child. So if I'm thinking that they're going, if, if they share something with me that I think um, puts them at risk of, of harming themselves or harming somebody else, that is really when, when I, I need to break confidentiality. Whenever I've had to break confidentiality, it's never a surprise. I do tell, tell the patient or tell the teenager ahead of time, hey, I'm worried about your safety. Hey, I'm worried about someone else's safety based on what you told me. I am going to go ahead and get an adult involved, and I, I do have them in the room. Whenever they tell me something that, that's private or sensitive, that isn't necessarily putting them at risk, but I feel like it's really, really important for the adults in their lives to know this information, I do encourage them to share it, right? So when we're talking about maybe some risky behavior, some choices that they're making that may not be so great, I encourage for them to share that information with the caregivers, and I uh, offer myself to sort of facilitate that conversation. So when we're talking about risky behaviors that they're making, maybe not great choices, I say, listen, I, I think mom and dad or right, the caregiver, I think they need to know about this. Um, do you feel comfortable? with that, I, I can help with that conversation. We can share it together. I can share with you in the room, out of the room. You can share it today here with me in the room, out of the room. I give them a lot of different options. And um, usually we, we come up to sort of a mutually beneficial agreement. So I think this is a really, really key part 
of a of a discussion with it with a teenager of any visit with a teenager and I really want to make sure that teenagers feel comfortable having this relationship with their pediatrician because ultimately at the end of the day a pediatrician is the doctor for the child not the parent. So mental health screening. There are a number of different validated mental health screening tools that we use in pediatrics. Different offices and different practices use different screening tools. So I've listed a, a number of them. And depending on how the practice and the visit is set up, some of these screenings are done before the visit where they, they will email you or maybe give you a questionnaire while you're in the waiting room and have the child um, and the parent fill these out. So I have found these to be tremendously beneficial when we start screening for things like anxiety and depression, especially recently when these incidents of these things have really um, skyrocketed. What I have found is sometimes teenagers are not great at recognizing that something is wrong. They're feeling not happy, but for some reason, we as a society have sort of uh, made it seem like that's the norm, like teenagers are moody and brooding and, and that's okay. Nothing has gone wrong. That, that's just puberty. But I have found that these screening questions are very, very good at pulling out um, a pathology. In other words, when something truly isn't right. And so sometimes um, the teenager themselves is even surprised when we review these questionnaires together. And I, I bring up my concern that, hey, I think maybe we're dealing with a diagnosis of anxiety or we're dealing with a diagnosis of depression. And that's uh, when we start to have the conversation both with the family and with family out of the room, because sometimes I find the teenagers can share a little bit more about what they're feeling and what's going on with their lives um, when, when, when there's no you know, adult in the room. Um, to necessarily judge them for it. Um, ADHD screening is another big one. Usually these types of screens start a little bit younger, but I do usually ask about attention span um, in the teenage populations, especially boys who are in school, um, you know, in yeshiva for longer periods of time. Sometimes they don't realize that maybe their struggle to pay attention isn't just the norm. Maybe there is true pathology going on. So if there's a concern about being able to pay attention, finishing tasks, any kind of impulsivity, I'll go ahead and administer a screen. It's simple, it's easy, it's free, it's pain, painless. It's just you know, a questionnaire that they fill out and sometimes we're able to gather a lot of very valuable information by doing that. Like I said, we have an informal discussion where I say, okay, mom, go ahead and step out of the room. And I ask them any, anything that concerned me on the questionnaire or anything that they wanna share with me in, pri in private. Um, and again, I really, really work hard on building that rapport um, when they're in sort of in the preteen years. So by the time we are dealing with an older teenager, they're already comfortable and um, expect this process to occur. Okay, switching gears a little bit, vaccines, not just for little kids. So a few really, really important vaccines that we give in the teenage age group. So the first is the Tdap. So the T stands for tetanus, the D stands for diphtheria, and that little P stands for pertussis. So this is sort of a, a, I call it a little bit of a booster, very similar to the vaccine that they would have gotten earlier on in their years, um, usually school age. Um, they sort of complete the DTAP series. So the TDAP is a little bit of a booster where we want to make sure they're mainly up to date on that T, that capital T, that tetanus. Tetanus is an unusual disease in the sense that you don't get it from other people, but there's enough of it in the ground, in the soil, and teenage boys like to um, go on adventures, not always with their shoes on. And so it is a population that's a little bit riskier for tetanus. So we really want, want to make sure that they're covered from that standpoint. Two meningitis vaccines that we offer. The first one covers um, it's the Menactra and the Menbono um, uh, brands, depending on what your office carries. And that first one is the one that we offer to all teens. It prevents against um, the most common uh, subtypes of the meningitis um, bacteria. So it's extremely important, especially if you have boys who are going away to Shiva, who are not going to be living at home, who are going to be living amongst other boys. Meningitis in those types of environments spreads very, very quickly. Men B is the one that we don't offer to everybody, depends on, the, on their risk, depends on um, if there's any kind of immune problems going on with the child, any kind of underlying medical disease or their living environment. Um, some, sometimes that may be offered depending on the situation, but those first two are pretty standard to be offered for teens. HPV, I want to just, this this really deserves its own slide, and HPV can be a whole separate discussion, um, and, and it really can, can, you know, I can go on and on about this. This is one of my favorite uh, vaccines to talk about. HPV comes up a lot when we talk about teenage girls, and so I think there's this um, misconception that it, it's, it's not something that's offered or should be given to teenage boys, and that's absolutely false. So HPV, what is it? It is a virus that is very, very closely linked to multiple different types of cancers. The number one, the biggest one, the most common one we talk about is cervical cancer. Um, so obviously not so relevant to boys. Uh, however, HPV is also associated with 
anal cancer, penile cancer, or pharyngeal or throat cancer. And obviously those are all things that boys and girls can get. So I, I highly, highly strongly um, recommend the HPV vaccine series, depending on what age you started, either a two-part or a three-part series, but extremely, extremely effective in preventing cancer is one of the only vaccines um, that can actually prevent the development of a malignancy, prevent the development of cancer. So um, extremely, extremely valuable and important. And then the, the two that I think we're going to be seeing more frequently or ones that um, are going to come up no matter what age you are is the COVID and the flu vaccine. So we are, uh, again, this, these two could be their own separate topics, but COVID vaccine, we recommend at least um, two doses. And now I think most likely three doses um, with the new bivalent booster coming out really, I think probably in the next week um, or two weeks at the latest. The flu vaccine also strongly recommended. Flu can be extremely dangerous, even to people who don't have underlying medical disease. I've seen perfectly healthy teenagers get extremely sick with flu, end up in the hospital and need quite a bit of support. So flu is another one that I recommend on an annual basis. And finally, so now let's shift over to, to the physical exam part. So Dr. Siegel will talk a little bit more about all the different parts, but I want to mention scoliosis because it's a big one. So what is scoliosis? It's an abnormal curvature of the spine. And this is something that we start screening for way before kids are teenagers, basically from the time that they can stand and they can bend forward, I start screening for scoliosis. The very simple test, you stand forward. If you've ever seen, you know, if, if there's any, any teenagers listening or any parents of teenagers, you've probably seen this happen at the doctor's office where you stand with your feet together, you bend forward, probably you're not wearing a shirt and they kind of like do one of these um, over, over the curve of the spine and, and they stand with their eye at, um, at, at the level of the back to see if there's any uh, lumps or bumps or anything that looks uneven. So scoliosis um, usually, and by the way, on, on that bottom is a scoliometer, which is a little bit old school, but I really like using it um, because it helps you estimate the, the actual angle of the scoliosis if you're not sure if it's like very, very subtle. But scoliosis, which is abnormal curvature of the spine, um, can cause some significant problems. It's a spectrum. So most scoliosis that we see is very, very mild, um, doesn't necessarily need any intervention, but it's important for us to know that it exists and it's important for us to monitor its progression. As kids grow and as they get taller, especially boys, sometimes that scoliosis right after their growth spurt can actually become much more severe. So we really, really want to make sure that it's not getting worse and this test is helpful for that. If it is getting worse, or we would think it's getting worse, sometimes we'll get a series of x-rays, and um, those x-rays actually estimate the angle of the abnormal spine curvature. For minor things, for minor angles or minor scoliosis, we don't do a whole lot. Sometimes we'll refer to physical therapy. Um, sometimes there's a brace involved. For more severe scoliosis, we may send to a surgeon. Scoliosis surgery is not a benign thing, so we really try to hold off unless it's it's something that's really critical. Because what happens is, scoli severe scoliosis is left untreated. Sometimes that curvature um, can become so severe that kids may have a restriction in their breathing and their lungs, and sometimes even their cardiac function. That's at the most extreme end of the scoliosis spectrum. On the more mild end of the scoliosis spectrum, if it's not treated, it can cause chronic back pain, um, discomfort, especially boys. Again, in yeshiva sitting for a really long time, have really, really heavy backpacks, we want to make sure that that you know their, their backs are healthy and strong. And so it's important for us to, to measure this and to screen for this on a regular basis to make sure that there's no issue. So I'm going to stop here and give the screen to Dr. Siegel. Okay, so thank you very much for that presentation. Um, Dr. Siegel is going to be our next speaker. Uh, a little bit about Dr. Siegel. She attended New York College of Osteopathic Medicine. She did her training at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine for residency as well as fellowship in adolescent medicine, which is just a fancy word for teenage medicine um, at Cohen Children's Medical Center or Northwell. Um, she works at the clinic as the clinical director of adolescent services at Elmer's Hospital and as an assistant professor of pediatrics at ICANN School of Medicine, Mount Sinai. Dr. Siegel takes care of adolescent or young adult patients. She teaches and mentors medical students, resident physicians, and nurse practitioners. She continues to serve on hospital and other academic committees. She has presented her research on various adolescent medicine topics and has participated in workshops at academic conferences. She lives in Great Neck, New York, and she enjoys spending time with her husband, three adult children, and her dog, Sally. Um, all right. So without further ado, I'm just going to go ahead and screen share so that we can follow along. One moment. And here we go. Okay. 
and everyone's able to see Dr. Siegel, you can see the slides. Let me just take us, sorry, to the first one. Let's go all the way to the first one and then we can reshare. Okay, that should work. Just have to unmute yourself. Sorry. Okay. okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ben-Hayoun and uh, Dr. Berkovich. I thought your talk was excellent. So uh, let me continue on the theme. Um, so uh, I'm going, as Dr. Berkovich said, uh, I'm gonna be talking about the team physical exam in greater detail. Uh, I'll review screening questions that we asked the um, the parent and the child, uh, the lab tests that we typically do for a male adolescent visit. Uh, we'll review a sports clearance exam. So, you know, that, that exam that, uh, you know, you bring in your forms and we wanna make sure that you're okay to play your sport of choice. And then I'm gonna review the male genital exam. I have no disclosures. Next slide, please. Okay, so teen healthcare. Um, uh, Dr. Berkovich um, uh, alluded to a lot of these topics, but I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. Hopefully there's not too much overlap. So uh, as she does, I love adolescents, um, less adolescent boys, adolescent girls. They're challenging. They're exciting. It's a um, you know, it's forward thinking, they're going from childhood to adulthood. Um, what's really special about adolescent years is that there are many physical and emotional changes um, that's secondary to, you know, hormone surge, hormonal flux. Um, that's what causes um, the puberty, um, which you know, we all know is uh, something that you go through during your adolescent years. Um, so there are puberty, the physical changes of puberty includes growth, getting taller, growing in height, uh, your voice is changing, and it's getting deeper, you're growing hair, facial hair, armpit hair, genital hair, body hair, um, your genitalia you're growing bigger, um, also, your emotions are, are like a roller coaster, or they could be, uh, whether it be boys or girls, you're happy one day, less happy another day. Um, and whether it be in, with your family, in your yeshiva, um, in your doctor's office, expectations for you are changing. Um, because we know that you're learning about yourself, you're taking responsibility for your health and habits, you're developing your own identity, and you're developing new friendships. Next slide, please. As Dr. Brokovich talked about, um, how does the teen health visit differ? Well, she talked a lot about confidentiality, and as you can see my little cartoon on the bottom there. Um, so, um, you know, there's a, a, a relationship between the provider and the, whether it be the doctor, the nurse practitioner, and the patient, and um, this private communication, and um, as Dr. Bergovic said, we, we separate the parent and the child and we ask a lot of questions. And my lips, lips are sealed or should I say zippered? Uh, whatever you tell me in private stays private. But as she said, um, you know, there are certain circumstances at, at which we may have to break privacy and we, we talk to you about it. And it's best if actually we help you tell your parent certain things that are going on that uh, you know are potentially very concerning to us as clinicians. So I then invite your parent back into the room and I'll ask more questions of the both of you and then I'll start the physical exam. Next question, please. Ne sorry, next slide, please. Okay, so the physical exam is the yearly checkup. Um, we review medical and surgical history, allergies, medications uh, that are new. Um, the teen physical exam is similar to the pediatric exam, but as has already been said, we speak pay special attention to the back, scoliosis, forward bending, to make sure that there's no abnormal curve. And also I'm gonna be examining your 
genitals. I know it's a little embarrassing. It's called the GU exam, the genitourinary exam to assess puberty progression and abnormalities. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, the physical is very similar. We look at your, you know, your head, your eyes, your ears, um, look in your throat, uh, listen to your heart, your lungs, feel your belly. Um, you know, we do hearing and vision as um, you do in younger kids. So, um, you know, we ask a lot of screening questions and we do a lot of lab tests that are important in, in you know, for the adolescent years. So we do something called the psychosocial interview. Um, we ask about depression and anxiety. And as Dr. Berkovich said, there are different screens that are used to assess um, for, um, especially for depression. It's called a PHQ-9. Um, there are nine very important questions. We ask about how you've been, you know, have you been depressed, hopeless, uh, inability to concentrate in the past two weeks? Have you thought about self-harm? Um, have you thought, have you ever tried to hurt yourself? Are you thinking of not wanting to be here anymore? All very concerning, um, very important questions and concerning if, you know, the teen answers yes to any of those questions. Um, we ask about anxiety. Are you very worried about a lot of different things? Um, we ask about cigarette use, electronic cigarettes, vape, jewel, meals. Um, alcohol, drug use, marijuana, abuse of prescription or, or street drugs. We ask a lot about your eating habits. We know that obesity is very prevalent. We wanna make sure that you're you know, not restricting, that you're not binging, that you're not skipping meals. We ask about exercise habits. We wanna make sure you are exercised. We wanna make sure you're not exercising too little or too much. Sleep habits, body image self-esteem, very important areas that we need to intervene on because you don't, if you don't feel good about yourself, it's, you don't, you don't necessarily make good choices and you may not do well in school. So we really want to get in there. And if there's a problem, we want to intervene and, and suggest certain um, counseling or, um, you know, other modalities to help you. Um, so, Adolescence is a time of emerging sexuality. Um, it, we're talking about sexual identity, attraction, healthy relationships, friendships. And we also ask about school and academics to make sure all of that is going well. Um, also, we talked about lab tests. Um, I said I was gonna talk about that. So in young boys, um, we don't worry as much about anemia like we do in girls because boys don't have a period. We you know, are concerned when a boy is fatigued or has uh, uh, an increase in infection. So we you know, certainly uh, want to look at your hemoglobin and hematocrit. Uh, hemoglobin is the protein in your cells and the hematocrit is the number of cells within a certain area of your blood. So we wanna make sure you have enough cells. And usually the doctor will do something called the CBC, which contains a complete blood count, which contains the hemoglobin and hematocrit. And usually in boys, we do it every few years every two or three years, but um, some people definitely like to do it every year. And certainly if we have any concerns, we will do it every year or even more frequently. Um, also what's really important is a lipid screen that includes a cholesterol and triglycerides. Um, it's best to do a lipid screen fasting. That's a complete lipid screen. However, um, a lot of kids don't come in fasting. So we'll, we'll do a modified lipid screen. Um, and we usually do it one time between 11 and 14 years old, one time during mid adolescence, that's like 16 to 17 years old. And late adolescence, we do it about 19 to 20 years old. And certainly we do it more frequently if the patient is obese or there's a strong family history of hyperlipidemia, 
or um, atherosclerosis. Let me also just say that um, one thing that's really important uh, for me to do as a physician is during the um, physical exam, um, a lot of time for reassurance, make sure everything's okay, you know, conversation, reassuring the patient, the parent, and also doing anticipatory guidance, talking about, you know, keeping safe, wearing a helmet when you bicycle, uh, you know, making sure that, uh, you know, there's safe driving if you're ready to drive, um, make sure that you're eating well, brushing your teeth, um, all different um really to uh, emphasize that health habits are important and it's important to start them at this age. Next slide, please. So now I'm gonna go on to the sport participation exam. Most of the time it's embedded within the, um, the regular healthcare maintenance exam, the regular checkup. Um, sometimes it may be done at a different time, but let's talk about it. The purpose of it is to evaluate the fitness of the athlete, meaning the student, the patient, that particular sport. Um, and um, it's best to do the physical exam well, it definitely has to be done within the past year, um, but it's really best to do it within the past, you know, two to three to six months. And the aim of the sport participation exam is to make sure that athlete or that potential athlete is fit to do that sport and to avoid injury. Let me just review. There are two kind of two categories of sports is contact sports, which includes like football, basketball, um, hockey, and then there's non-contact sports, which is like tennis, swimming, track. So there are conditions that we ask about that could interfere with you performing at your best. So medically, we want to know if you know, if you have a history of a heart murmur, underlying heart problems, uncontrolled asthma, chest pain or severe sh <clears throat> shortness of breath with exercise, certain seizure disorders, diabetes not well controlled, <clears throat> smoking or e-cigarette, use drug or alcohol use, and also a COVID history with complications. And we'll talk about COVID in sports in a few minutes. <clears throat> Structurally, um, I want to make sure that you're physically fit, that um, your muscles are not weak, that you don't have joint problems, that you don't have heat intolerance, that you know your body is not weak, <clears throat> and that you don't have any prior injuries. So, for instance, swimmers who have weak chest wall muscles, you know, may have to build up their muscles in order to, you know, be really good at swimming or an old shoulder injury, which still hasn't healed, could put you at risk for re-injuring. So we wanna make sure that, you know, we're talking to you, we're evaluating and we're um, properly, you know, giving the, the guidance. It's really important also during a sports physical to assess pubertal development since contact sports really, um, put you at a higher risk. And so therefore we wanna make sure that you're skeletally mature um, to be able to handle that sport. We also assess the need for sports protective equipment like sports goggles if someone has vision problems, um, a testes cup if someone has one testicle or if um, they you know, have had a history of testicular rotation or torsion. Um, we just wanna keep the parts of your body safe. Also a helmet, if someone has had frequent concussions you know, uh, or um, some other neurologic problem. We wanna make sure that your immunizations are up to date, especially your tetanus shot. Next slide, please. Okay, so sports clearance, um, just a little bit more details. Um, you know, we want to make sure that you're okay so that I can confidently clear you um, because God forbid if something happens to you on the field, um, you know, the, 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 um, also the schools um, are, you know, feel very responsible um, for any kind of injury. Um, and so we want to make sure that you're in your best um, uh, health 
so you can, um, you know, really perform at your best. So certain questions that we ask, have you ever passed out or, became, or have become very dizzy during or after exercise? Have you had chest pain during exercise or shortness of breath? Do you tire more quickly than your peers? Um, have you had blood pressure problems or a heart murmur? History of heart racing like palpitations or skipping beats? Family history of sudden death before age 50. Why is that important? because we know that certain heart conditions are um, inherited. And so we want to make sure that, you know, you haven't inherited it and, you know, that there's no genetic component. So any time we have any concern um, that there could be something, you know, wrong with your heart or um, you just want to be sure, we will send you to a pediatric cardiologist. Um, they'll do a very in-depth interview and they will probably do an electrocardiogram and an echocardiogram and the clearance may actually come from them. So um, one other very important question is history of concussion or serious head trauma. So we know that co concussion happens. What is it? It's when um, the head gets hit, whether the you know, someone collides or um, the, the, the athlete falls on the ground and their brain is kind of uh, shook a little bit, you know, goes from side to side. And we know that that actually can cause some changes, temporary changes in the brain. Um, it's like a brain injury and it can affect memory, learning, coordination. And it's really important to rest afterwards to recover. You want to prevent any further head injuries because we know that these injuries can be cumulative. So we do something called a, um, uh, a very graduated return to play. And um, I'm sure if uh, there was thoughts of a concussion, your doctor will go over the with that, you will go over that with you. Um, just, you know, not going right back to your sport, but gradually building up so that you don't re injure yourself. Um, another issue is COVID in sports. Um, we know that children, young adults, teenagers that had severe COVID, who were hospitalized, who had prolonged symptoms, who had fever at higher risk for more severe inflammation of their body, different organs, uh, heart included, and that could actually affect the heart muscle impede the pumping capability of the heart. So any concerns will send you right to the pediatric cardiologist for further evaluation. And <clears throat> really important, asthma should be controlled, your um, albuterol pump or whatever you use should be up to date, not expired. And you may need to use your asthma pump, you know, about 15 minutes prior to exercise. And we'll go over all of that with you. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm gonna shift to the male genitalia exam. Um, uh, it's part of the routine healthcare maintenance uh, visit for male adolescents every year. Um, it's really important to assess um, puberty progression to make sure you're um, moving in the right direction because that really influences your future um, fertility. We want to make sure everything is, is going as planned. And we'll you know, uh, I, we, I'm talking collectively as uh, uh, physicians, we look at your pubic hair and testicular size to make sure that puberty is going um, the way it should be. Um, you know, when we, when I find abnormalities that the patient, you know, may not discuss secondary to discomfort, you know, talking about it, I can actually reassure the patient hey, you know, that's okay, that's normal, or hey, I'm not sure. So let's, you know, make an appointment with the pediatric urologist. Um, so let's talk about the exam. So the exam is standing. Um, there's always somebody else in the room, um, whether it be, you know, certainly the parent would be behind the curtain. I presume most offices have curtains today. My office does. And they'll either be, you know, a nurse, a PCA, some type of chaperone in the room as well, or some doctors may feel parent, you know, behind the curtain is certainly good enough. Um, <clears throat> with a gloved hand, I, I examine on the male genitals. Um, 
Uh, I, you know, touch the, the, you know, the testicles. Um, you know, first I look, I, I look at the size and, you know, I touch uh, the testicle to make sure that it, um, you know, there's no abnormal lumps or bumps. Um, look at the scrotum, that's the sac around the testicle. I look at the penis, make sure that that's normal and that the peeing um, tube, you know, the external, what's called the meatus is, is normal looking. I eva evaluate any abnormalities, like I said, lumps, swelling, pain, rash, like a jock itch. And also um, some boys talk, um, they have these little pink pearly papules, which are very normal along the rim of the glands of the penis. And so a lot of reassurance going on and <clears throat> also look for pathology. And we sometimes see it. Um, testicles could have varicoceles, hydroceles, um, masses, and then in general, that part of the um, body could have um, a hernia. That's like the groin area could actually um, have a hernia. Next slide, please. So um, let's talk about a varicocele. Um, so over here on the left, the left slide is normal. You see the penis. And then uh, to the right is the scrotum. Um, which is a bag, uh, which of skin, which houses, which you know the testicle, which is uh, pink, the pink fleshy is uh, area is within, and then you see uh, over on the right above, like um, like normal looking veins. Um, when you look at the uh, picture on the right, you'll see that the vein area looks very different. It's, it's, um, it's like swollen. It's what we call varicose. The veins are enlarged. It, we call it like a bag of worms. Um, and it, this condition is usually found in 15% of adolescent boys on routine um, exam. It's mostly without symptoms. However, some boys report like a heaviness in their scrotum and it usually occurs on the right side. It's severe. It can cause decreased sperm count for that testicle. So yeah, we do worry, you know, down the road about fertility, but you know, most boys we can observe. Um, so the treatment, you know, you do a sonogram to evaluate actually what we're looking at now, because we only can see the outside and feel, but this is with a sonogram, we can actually see the dilation. And um, uh, we, if we're concerned, we may send to the pediatric urologist, which is a doctor for that part of the body. Usually we observe, and if the condition is severe or progresses, um, surgery can be done and the, uh, the condition, uh, the problem can be corrected. Next slide, please. Next condition is hydrocele. And as you can see on my model on the left, um, so that's a testicle sitting in a scrotum and you see above like fluid. Um, that's a normal amount of fluid. And when you look to the picture on the right, you can see that uh, that scrotum is a lot larger and there's a lot more fluid um, surrounding in the test uh, surrounding the testicle in the um, in the scrotum. So a uh, hydrocele is when fluid collects in this thin sheath surrounding the testicle. Teens can develop a hydrocele due to inflammation or injury within the scrotum. It's common and benign. If big or, or there's discomfort, it can be repaired surgically. Next slide, please. Okay, everyone's heard of an inguinal hernia. That's a common one. So what is it? It's where you get, um, it's usually, the inguinal is another word for the groin area. And there's usually an outpocketing, like a bump um, in that um, area that you, um, can see it may become more prominent when somebody lifts or laughs or coughs, exercise, it's like a bulge. And you can see uh, a side view, a lateral view, where you see um, that there's um, this, this pink, which is intestine, and it's coming through the, the red, orange red, which is muscle, and coming out like right under the skin. So, 
again, you know, inguinal hernia is part of the intestine protrudes through a weak spot in the abdominal muscles at the groin. Um, I told you what, you know, what, what kind of activities aggravated and of interest, the bulge of the groin many times disappears when lying down. You see it when the patient is standing, it disappears when the patient lies down. Symptoms for the patient could be pressure or heaviness in that area. And surgery is usually indicated to protect the bowel from getting stuck in the small defect of the muscle. Okay, next slide, please. And my last slide. So testicular masses, that sounds scary. So just to let you know, testicular cancer is uncommon. Thank God. However, it is one of the most common cancers in teenagers and young men. Um, it's treatable, it's curable, especially at early stages. Um, risk factors include being Caucasian and a family history of, of testicular cancer. And, you know, um, I really stress uh, testicular self exams. Um, you know, teenage, young teenage boys should start to. Um, get to know what their testicles feel like to make sure that if there's any abnormal lumps and bumps that develop, that they'll notice a change and so that the problem can be evaluated and taken care of as early as possible. Let me say, let me just say that not all testicular masses are cancer. So, um, you know, but it is important if you have a concern uh, to go to the doctor and make sure that everything's okay. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Siegel. Um, I think we got very comprehensive rundown of everything teenage boy tonight. Um, I do want to open the floor for any questions. If anyone wants to post a question in the chat, they can feel free to do so. Um, anything they want to ask. So we'll give everyone like a minute or two to gather thoughts. I would say from my end, my question would be, um, you know, once a adolescent has a well child visit, um, you know, and is cleared, let's say to play sports and everything checks out with their anatomy, everything in the questions that are asked, their screening questions are, you know, normal. Um, how often would you recommend that they come in? Is once a year sufficient? Should it be more often? Is it only when there's a new concern that develops? Like what would you tell a parent on average? Because like I think uh, was said early on, sometimes teenage boys like to avoid going to the doctor's office. So at the minimum, um, okay. that once a year checkup or is there ever a reason to come in more often? I definitely think that the once a year checkup is, you know, recommendation of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, certainly, um, you know, there for we have routine exams, routine healthcare maintenance exams. That's a routine checkup, and then we have urgent visits. So if somebody has uh, an ear infection, a throat infection. Um, they have concerns that they could have COVID or um, they have a, you know, an injury um, uh, to their knee, to their hand, to their wrist, certainly come in. Um, we're there to reassure, to evaluate, to reassure and to treat. I would also add that it really also depends on some other risk factors, right? So if we're dealing with somebody who has maybe a strong history of heart disease in their family or a strong history of cardiac death at a young age, those are kids I probably wanna see a little bit more frequently. Those are kids I probably wanna to send to the cardiologist and they wanna see those kids more frequently, right? To make sure that, that we're not missing something and to catch um, something that could potentially be very, very serious. 
as well as kids who maybe have some underlying medical problems like asthma, sickle cell, right? Those are athletes who I'm so happy they're athletes that that's great for their underlying disease, but I probably want to see them a little bit more frequently as a result of having something else that I want to check on. And then being an athlete makes them right a little bit more higher risk, which is okay, as long as we're being safe. And that's one of the many reasons that come back and see me maybe every six months, or maybe even three months, depending, depending on how well their disease is controlled, um, to make sure that that they're doing all the things and that I'm aware of of any new things that have come up that that right, we need to maybe ask one. Right, that, I agree. Um, you know, chronic illness, uh, asthma, diabetes, pre-diabetes. Um, we have a lot of obesity, unfortunately. You know, where you know we do a lot of weight management, and um, so those, like you said, would be the reasons to come back. And I think something else that um, parents can avail themselves of in different offices, obviously it varies by office, but there's often a nutritionist or a mental health counselor that work at either the adolescent doctor's office or even the general pediatrician's office, that if a patient isn't seeing the doctor, at the very least, they can follow up with a nutritionist or a social worker um, to check in on those parts of their health. So that's very important too. Okay, so that being said, um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. I am going to be posting uh, the post-session survey in the chat momentarily. So let me just go ahead and add that in right now so everyone has it, whoever is interested in participating. And like we said, we're raffling off an Amazon gift card for whoever was able to complete the pre and the post. So there it is. Um, I wanna thank everyone for joining us this week and for everyone who was able to join us last week when we did our um, teenage girl talk as well. If you have any questions, uh, feedback, anything of that sort, please email teenhealth at joma.org, T-E-E-N-H-E-A-L-T-H at joma, J-O-W-M-A dot org. I'm going to go ahead and put, put that in the chat as well. Um, any feedback helps us tailor the content of our webinars. Um, and we try to host these webinars at least once every few months. So for any of the parents listening or caregivers, um, even healthcare practitioners, if you have any feedback or comments, please feel free to get in touch. Um, we want to send a special thank you to the Jewish press for recognizing the importance of this work and helping us spread the word. And as always, a very special thank you to our teen health team at JOMA comprised of a bunch of volunteers. We have doctors and student doctors, Dr. Gail Gutman, Dr. Alyssa Minkin, Dr. Mimi Knoll, Dr. Sharon Stoll, Hadassah Stein, Shoshana Lunzer, Brendan Newman, Mary Korlansky, and our administrator, Omit, um, for all their help. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to get in touch, teenhealth at joma.org. And thank you everyone for listening. I'll leave everything open for another minute or two so that you can go ahead and copy and paste the link for the survey if you're interested in filling it out and have a good night.